Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Peter Llewellyn. I run the services at medcomsnetworking.com and the associated website. So information services, um, uh, activity, resources and so on for people who work um, across the globe in and around medical communications, medical education, medical publishing and the associated businesses. You'll find lots going on at medcomsnetworking.com. Uh, we do a lot of, um, of, of, of webinars and such like create a lot of video content. You'll find that over at Network Pharma TV collected together. There's more than 500 videos now on all manner of topics related to Medcoms. And, and also a shout out to those of you who are interested in joining Medcoms, and maybe as a medical writer or as an account manager or whatever. Um, I do quite a lot to provide information and guidance to people who are trying to learn more about the business and get a career. Uh, you'll find a lot of information at firstmedcomsjob.com and other places. So go and have a look around if you've not had a look around. Um, these webinars are great fun and it's great because we can involve an international audience. We've got a great international audience um, and quite a big one today. So thank you everyone for joining us. Um, today we're joined by the guys from Springer Healthcare IME. Um, we're going to talk about um, providing education to HCPs on the different formats and so on. So without further ado, um, I'm going to hand over to Elspeth to introduce herself and start the presentation. Over to you. Perfect. Thanks, Peter. And it's amazing that so many people have joined. So um, really looking forward to today and having a really interesting uh, discussion later on. Um, so to introduce myself, I'm Elspeth Headley. I'm Global Director of CME at Springer Healthcare IME. And I'm joined by uh, two of my colleagues today. So Caroline Halford, who's Development Director at Springer Healthcare, and Rebecca Cox, who is the Principal Medical Writer at Springer Healthcare IME. So first of all, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about us and who we are. So Springer Healthcare IME is part of Springer Healthcare, which in turn is part of the wider Springer Nature International Publishing Group. We develop independent educational activities um, through financial support from industry, and this is in the form of educational grants. Because it's independent in nature, all of our programs are therapy area or disease specific. We will never focus, for example, on a, a single product or drug. And all of our programs are designed to meet educational gaps in either the knowledge and or the skills of healthcare professionals. And to do that, we work really closely with international experts and faculties to help us design and deliver our programs. Now, where appropriate, many of our programs are CME accredited, so it might be important just to clarify the difference. We produce both IME content and CME content, and really the way in which we work across both those two types of program are the same. It's still very independent and arm's length in nature. But when a program is CME accredited, um, we either apply to an accreditation body or we work in joint providership with a, an accredited provider in order that that program can offer CME credits or points to the doctors when they've um, participated and actually completed the program. But otherwise, in terms of everything we talk about today in the design and the format of the program, the kind of thought process is exactly the same. Um, again, because we're independent, we do um, run our programmes with no influence from the funding company. So this extends to the design and the development of the programme, the content itself, and then any choice of faculty or speakers we may make. Um, because of that, we also have to recruit and engage all of the audiences to our programmes. So that really ties in with today's talk and why choosing the format is so important to bring in that audience. And of course, we have to measure and report back on the outcomes of the learning activity. And this is really key as well, because choosing the right format can really help you maximise your success of your outcomes measures, whether that's in terms of, again, how many people come to your programme or the learning effectiveness of the programme itself. So at the very start of a program, we will have identified the educational gap that we're going to address. We'll have defined our learning objectives. And at that point, we be can be really begin to think about the design of our program and which format we're going to choose. And I think it's quite a, you know, it's, it's quite an old cliche, but actually we do start with the end in mind and work backwards to, and think what the program should achieve before thinking about what format we should deliver it in. But this slide just shows really and emphasizes the, you know, the huge range of ways in which you can um, deliver medical education to healthcare professionals and the different formats and software you might use to do that. 
you might want to deliver a live event, so a symposia or a webinar. You might be thinking about an e-learning solution and maybe bringing in some case studies and real world evidence to those. Or you might be thinking much shorter bite-sized pieces of education, maybe a podcast or some very small um, expert interviews perhaps. And we have experience across all of these um, variety of formats, but what I should stress is this list isn't exhaustive. There are so many more and it's constantly evolving. So perhaps five years ago, um, we wouldn't have thought of social media as a, a delivery mode for education, but now it's not uncommon to see that being used at all. So we really have to um, keep a pace and, and, and see what's happening out there so that we offer these different varieties of, of content. So what are the other things we need to bear in mind? Well, you know, doctors are just like the rest of us. They have different ways they like to learn and different preferences for how they want to absorb information. So some of them might be visual learners where they, you know, they really want to see sort of graphical representation of, of their content and the education. In this case, we might look to provide videos or maybe video animations or even uh, data summarized in visual, really nice visual infographics that would suit these learners quite well. If they're auditory, le auditory learners, maybe we would um, think about a discussion being recorded between some experts or perhaps a podcast. If they like to read and write when they're learning, we've got options through transcripts, through infographics again, or even some downloadable materials that they might be able to print out and take with them on the go. And if they're kinesthetic learners and they like that hands-on, have a go style approach, then we have also, there's lots of options there. So that you can do quizzes, case studies, um, and really build a lot of interaction into your um, educational solutions and even some self-directed learning. So going back to what I just said a little bit earlier about thinking about what we're trying to achieve at the very beginning, it might be enough um, that you just want to maximize the reach of your data or your message. So you might just be concerned with making sure that the right audiences are aware of your data. And if that's the case, you might think about a live symposia or a webinar just to get that message out there so people know about, about that information. Or it might be really important to you that um, doctors have an increase in their learning and comprehension after taking part in a program so that they understand or they engage and they understand the clinical implications of what they're engaging with. In this case, maybe you might think of an e-learning uh, e solution and case studies are a really valuable tool um, when you're thinking about how to deliver that kind of content. Or perhaps you might want to demonstrate what real world impact of your program. And this is probably the hardest one of the three to achieve where you want the HCPs to take their learning that they've gained and to shape their own clinical practice through um, behavior change. So in these cases, you might need a more in-depth program, um, something that might be self-directed where the clinicians can actually see the application of data and guidelines into some sort of clinical treatment scenarios. But having said all this, this is just educational theory and it's just what we think. And we became really aware that actually we also needed to go out and see if this aligned with what our audiences, our HCPs actually wanted. Um, so we developed a survey um, and that we disseminated out to our HCP audiences. But I'm going to say no more about that because I'm going to hand over to Caroline, who's going to talk you through some of the results and what we found out when we did that. Thanks so much, Elspeth. So yeah, one of the biggest questions that we get asked is what are the preferred learning formats for healthcare professionals? So we found this out through distributing a survey through three large European medical congresses, through social media polling, and through our IME database of learners. And we actually got near to 2000 healthcare professional responses. And I've got the results on the next slide, but we were really pleased with that sample size. And once we had that data, we wanted to test out the theory on some real life projects. So we picked two projects, one of which was a rare disease program and one of which was in early stage breast cancer, just to see whether the contents and the formats that our healthcare professionals said that they preferred were the most engaged with and impactful. Oh, next slide. Yeah. So here are the top line results for the survey. And in terms of what attracted our healthcare professionals to education, 
what they said was the vast majority actually said that educational format was the key driver. If the format is right for them, that is the, the, the thing that's most likely to make them click into it. If the content has CME accreditation as well, that was also a big driver. And interactive elements were also very, very popular. So uh, anything where, for example, a quiz or interactive case studies, something where it's not just static and them just watching something where they could actually engage. Um, the second most high driver to education was length of format. So anything that took 20 minutes or more was an absolute no-go. It has to be short form content, that, like snackable bite-sized content. And they also told us that they really value the chance to ask questions, questions specific to their needs so that they could ensure that the uh, content was relevant. In terms of the opposite, what was going to deter experts from engaging with education, it's sort of the opposite of what we see on the left hand side. So anything that's got a lengthy registration process where they're keying in too much data, big turn off. Also, long form content. So we did ask them, what do you mean by that? And it was 20 minutes or more was a big no, no. They also were anything that was not relevant to their therapeutic area or geographic region was also a big deterrent. So our experts are looking for targeted information that they can use in clinical practice. If, if it was an online program that was complex to navigate, with lots of little clicks that you didn't know where you were going, that was also a big no-no. And if it was, if, if there was an unknown faculty, if they did not recognize the experts leading the program, that was also a big a deterrent. So thinking about our experts saying that format is the key driver, we really wanted to dig into this more because it was 82% that said that learning format was the most important factor to them. So then we went to ask, what do you mean by that? What formats are you most willing to engage with? Interactive e-learning was by far the most popular type of education. But then conversely, they also very much valued um, basic downloadable resources for on-the-go, on-demand learning. So things like um, infographics or shorts or brochures that they could download and scribble notes on. Expert webinars led by well-known faculties were seen as valuable. But the real kicker is, the key takeaway, is that when we asked them what their favourite formats was, there was no one size fits all, which is super frustrating because it would be nice if everyone said, yes, I love an infographic. But when we asked them to rate their favourite formats, as you can see here, there's such a wide range, like downloadable static materials, super popular, but then you've also got live webinars and on podcasts. So... And I asked this poll on LinkedIn earlier in, uh, well, on Saturday, I think, and asking everyone on that's on this webinar, what is your favorite format? And that's also reflecting very diverse types of contents. So ultimately, no one size fits all, and we couldn't stratify it by therapeutic area or specialty. So it shows that a range of formats is needed. So I'm going to now hand it over to Rebecca to talk through our educational programs and how we implemented these factors. Thanks, Caroline. Um, so yeah, I'll be taking you through just two examples um, of how we try to implement and slightly experiment with the um, multi-channel, multi-format approach. Um, so the first example is one that's personally very close to my heart. I've been working on it for two years now, um, but we were tasked with educating about an uh, ultra rare disease called fibrodysplasia ossificans progressiva, which is a bit of a mouthful. Um, so for short is FOP. Um, it's a really devastating disease that causes ossification um, to occur in muscles, tendons and ligament, ligaments, um, which causes progressive, progressive um, restriction, giving rise to its other name, which is stone man syndrome. Um, so the main objective of this program was really to raise awareness of the condition, um, as many HEPs have never even heard of it, and misdiagnosis and mismanagement can cause real harm to people that have this condition with like minimal invasive procedures such as a biopsy causing this ossification to occur. Um, so again, with that in mind, there was a really big challenge with the fact that audience was so vast, not just globally, but across specialties, as um, there's many different specialties that could be faced with a person with FOP from um, 
kind of general pediatricians to even dentists, for example. Um, and like I said, with not many people having even heard of the condition, we needed to grab their attention and make them want to learn about it um, and to want to engage with our content. Um, so again, with all of that in mind, with our survey results, we felt that a kind of multi-channel, multi-format approach um, was appropriate. Um, and this was released in two phases over two rounds of funding. Um, so I'll just go into a couple of ways that um, we kind of utilize those survey results to kind of adapt our formats. Um, so obviously, first off, we wanted to make, especially the first bits of content, really easily accessible really remove the obstacles to people um, accessing the content. Um, so we kicked it off with a really visual diagnostic quiz, um, which I think everyone likes a quiz to test themselves. And um, also because of the visual depictions of some of these quite horrific symptoms of the disease, I think it really pulled people in to want to learn more about it. And then also the kind of classic news article summaries that um, people can stay up to date on everything new in FOP at that, that's, that point in time. Um, and like we just spoke about short completion times, um, given the rarity and lack of knowledge, we did have a lot of information to get across. Um, we pretty much had to cover all bases of identification, diagnosis, and the really complex management. It's, it's obviously a disease that affects all areas of the body. So there was a lot to get across. Um, and so to do this, we ended up breaking down longer pieces of content into chapters. So for example, our, our longer webinar, we break down into chapters as well as our interviews and podcast series. We added kind of content tags um, where people could skip to their topic of interest or use them as bookmarks to come back later to um, if they kind of remember where they left off. Um, and then thirdly on the slides, obviously we saw from the survey, people like to interact um, with their peers and ask questions. So again, with our webinar, we had quite a long period of time left for Q&A and that's obviously quite a traditional format, but I think it's one that we've seen stay and people are still liking that format. So, um, and this was actually one of the Q&As I've seen like the most engaged audience with, um, which I think is in part down to the kind of case-based format of the webinar content. And um, again, there was imagery of, of um, the patients in there. So I think, again, they had a lot of questions. They were really, really engaged. So that was really good to see. Um, and then we also set up a portal where healthcare professionals could submit a case to our expert faculty um, of if, someone that they'd seen had FOP or not, or alternatively, if they were treating someone they knew had been diagnosed with FOP, they could submit their experiences to our faculty and just kind of, yeah, share their experiences, peer-to-peer -peer learning. Um, so yeah, um, the ability to interact with content, um, we developed a really wide range of different types of digital e-learning. Um, some very simple techniques such as um, MCQs with the video modules and some more novel approaches such as um, you can see at the top there are interactive body and the bottom one is a diagnostic algorithm that we developed with our program director. Um, and we just we really wanted to make it non-linear, allow the user to move around in whatever they want, whatever way they wanted. Um, and we did see over half our learners kind of coming in, interacting with a bit of it, and then coming back later to interact with more of it. So proving the kind of theory that users kind of like spend the time they have and then return later if the content is, is engaging enough. Um, so yeah, again, a lot to be said for user-directed and non-linear learning. Um, and then I guess the bog standard webinar, um, when you're trying to get across quite a long complex piece of information. Sometimes you do need those longer formats, um, but like I said earlier, you can chop them down to allow people to um, skip to the part they want. Um, and like I say, I think audience q and is, is something that very much uh, our audience want to stay within the formats. 
Um, and again, e-learning, there's lots of different ways you can use that. Um, and we've received some really great feedback, especially on our more innovative activities where they could spend from 30 seconds to an hour, depending on kind of how much time they have. Um, so yeah, just quickly for the second example, the challenge was slightly different here. Obviously, early breast cancer is a very fast paced moving therapy area, and there's a lot more education in this space, um, as well as our content focus was um, a lot more narrow. Um, so we really needed our formats to be quick to develop and upload to ensure that we were producing timely content in line with the data releases that were um, f like fastly coming out basically. Um, so again, we utilize new summaries and short expert video interviews. Again, we added little content tags for kind of topics our audience could skip to. And then we also did some short patient case activities. Um, and yeah, to stand out from a lot of other content in the space, we um, were very lucky to have a very experienced patient advocate on our faculty. Obviously patient voice is something that is a hot topic and great interest of now. Um, but I know there's been many other webinars on, so I won't go into, but it demonstrated to be a real pull into this piece of content. And of, as part of that, we also developed a downloadable communication aid out of that conversation. Um, which again proved really, really popular for the time poor clinicians and we had over 1500 downloads of this. So it shows the real appetite for these kind of takeaway point of care formats that people can use in their clinics or, or yeah, um, whenever they deem appropriate. Um, so yeah, there are two examples of our experience kind of trial and error with um, different formats and now I'll pass back over to Elsbeth to see if it all worked. Yep I was going to say the big question is is did it all work so um, and also the frustrating answer is it's it's just really hard to say. What we do know from those two examples is that we know we saw very high engagement levels across both so we do know that Healthcare professionals like the, seeing the range of content available to them, and they do like that, that short, sort of um, more easy to access content. So going back to our list on the left hand side here of, of what Caroline presented about what we know our HCPs like, we know they like that snackable short content. So were we able to prove that? I, I think we were. We saw that when we ran a live CME webinar, we know that the registrants used that as a bookmark when they were registering for maybe watching later. So for that one event, we saw 32% of our registrations, um, the, the people who registered turn up live. But then we saw a 46% increase on that number who came back, watched the uh, on-demand version in their own time. And because they were broken up and chapterized, we also, as we said, saw people come back and watch different sections on different days. So I think we have shown that they do like to be able to do that, come back and just watch shorter, snackable pieces of content. We, they told us they like to interact with their peers and their content. And I think this is something we always try, you know, we always want to make our um, educational modules as um, interactive and as engaging as possible. And this is something that really uh, we capture through our qualitative uh, feedback and analysis. So very often we see quotes like the one I've included here, where people are saying that was really valuable to them. So this, this individual user said, you know, the example with the assessment questions in between really helped summarize what was explained and it was very informative and beneficial to me. So this is something that we see through that qualitative analysis. Um, and so I think we proved that it, it is a part of the education they like. We know they like society affiliation. We didn't go into that a lot here, but the first programme that Becky uh, spoke about, it was um, delivered in association with uh, a few societies. So maybe that collaboration did um, kind of give a sense of trustworthiness to the content as well. And finally, we know they like easy navigation. So some of the newer pieces of content that we've been um, delivering, we've seen very high engagement levels because they're very self-directed pieces of content. And we know and we have seen that easy navigation not only brings people in 
to access that education, but then it retains those learners. We see a longer time spent within that educational piece when they can take a look around and it's really easy to do so. So that's something we're now striving for when we're designing um, a lot of our future educational programs. So what didn't work and I actually saw a, a comment or a question about how successful was our case sharing in this program and we have to say that that's one thing that that wasn't successful whether that reflects you know the fact that this disease is so ultra rare and people just weren't seeing cases or whether it reflects we did in this instance choose the wrong format to use. It's quite hard to say, but that is something we're trying to understand more. And we're beginning to ask, ask ourselves questions such as, you know, in a digital e-learning environment, is that sense of community as important to our learners as it might be in a face-to-face -face, uh, environment? So we do really want to dig down and try to understand things on a, on a much more granular level. Um, so very, very quick summary here. We know that format is key, but we also know that picking the right one should be considered carefully. And there's a lot of different factors that you need to take into account. And maybe our programs highlight to us that sometimes a combination of styles and formats can actually be the best way forward when catering to a diverse audience. And this isn't just in terms of their learning preferences. It can be, um, you know, where they're accessing um, their education. You know, a, a HCP sat in their office is very different to someone who's um, commuting home and is just holding their mobile phone in one hand. Or we need to take into the fact that uh, they're, they're coming in on different devices. And for global programs, there'll be different le levels of uh, English language proficiency amongst our audiences as well. So, so many things to think about. Um, and it may, a lot of what we said may appear common sense, but we do really believe that it was important to go out and ask our HCPs what they thought, just to validate and make sure that what we as an educational agency were thinking also matched what they wanted. So in summary, we know they're seeking personalization, so they want to come in and choose what they want to access and when they want to do it. We know that they like to see a range of content styles that suits their preferences. On demand options obviously fit into their busy schedules a bit easily more easily and snackable content that they can come back to and return to and then interactivity um, is really key as well so the last point is i would just say you know this has all been great and we've learned a lot but of course it's constantly evolving and how we'll be delivering medical education in five years you know the landscape is going to be very different to how it is now or even five years ago so i think the important thing is that we've learned great to ask our HCPs, but we're going to have to keep doing that and evolve with that. So we, you know, ensure we're always matching their needs with what we're delivering. And that's it really. So we're really interested. I, I've seen so many questions come in and, and comments. So really interested to have a, a good discussion now on this. Fantastic. OK, thanks, Elizabeth. If we stop sharing, that's great. OK, um, as you say, there's quite a few questions and comments coming in and I'd encourage the audience to carry on going. So um, we probably won't um, be able to answer all your questions, but please, you know, give us as much as you've got and we'll, we'll weave what we can into the conversation. Um, can I just start with some just can I just ask start with some basic questions and I might have missed the point there slightly but I think it affects some of what the question is about um with your two case histories that you presented are they being essentially delivered on your own platforms I think yes, the answer they, is yes yes isn't it? they are and again that comes down to the independent nature of the content so we have to be the host uh, of the content and we will always for every program build a bespoke microsite that will house all of the content that we deliver as part of that program okay so as opposed to um i take your independence point but as opposed to using one of the healthcare professional platforms which have already got a community and so on, where you could build a microsite for instance so i mean yeah. I, I just want to be clear on that that is, you're talking about your platform yeah that's so, right and certainly never because of the cme i mean nature never sort of hand you know a content package handed over to the educational funder for them to host that's that's what we're not able to do yeah no i get that bit i get that bit um um, I suppose my question then comes around and there's been some questions coming in about promoting it and so on. Um, you know, if you if you do your own independent platform, however clever it is and bells and whistles and all the rest of it, you've got a job in hand to go out and promote it to get anyone to take any notice of it in the yeah. first place. 
as opposed to going somewhere where there's already a community. So yep. just talk a little bit about, because as I said, this is some of the questions came in on that front. Yep. Talk a little bit about how you go out and promote that platform. And have, sorry, and I don't, I just, I'm just showing my ignorance here. Are these independent little platforms that you've done on your own system and you go and promote them independently? Or have you got a an IME platform drawing a community into and saying, well, if you like this content, come this way. And if you like that, you just see there's a difference in there. And I'm just interested how you get the initial interest in what you're doing. It can be both. But if we if we imagine that we've built a sort of independent microsite for that programme, we use a range of tactics to bring in our audiences. And it's certainly one of the biggest challenges when we, you know, launch a programme. We can't just think, right, that's it. We've launched it now. Actually, the tough bit is to come. So going back to my very first slide because we are part of springer nature the international publishing group we can leverage to some extent some of that relationship so we can um you know send out adverts uh, through their e-alerts to their to journal subscribers we can put banners on um publishing websites the right. journal websites now that's great but we also do sort of um, bespoke um, marketing tactics ourselves so we have our own proprietary email databases that we've built up over a long number of years producing programs in this area so we email them um, Again, as Springer Healthcare, we often go to exhibitions, international congresses and exhibit. Um, so when we're doing that, we can take advantage of that and talk face to face with learners then and, and demo our programs. But finally, and increasingly the most important is actually social media. Um, so we are noticing that in some cases, 70, 80 percent of our learners are seeing, for example, an ad on Twitter coming through on their mobile device and then engaging in the content on that mobile device as well. So we employ a full range of tactics, but I do have to say social media is, is extremely important in, in bringing people in. Okay, and that probably that answers Emma's question. Just come in, then we'll go with social media as the as, as the um, as the most useful. Okay, yeah. okay, and that uh, the basic point you made in several different ways through the presentation is you can't suit all the people all the time, and and you know that's that's like my life. It's just like you can't do everything, um, and people like things in their own ways and all the rest of it. But it's really important to think about that when you're trying to approach a project. And um, again, I'm just going for a couple of things that I was a bit unsure about, and, and following this line of thought is your platform. Um, I think it was case number one. You said something like. The quizzes um, at the top of that slide, something like the quizzes were freely accessible. There was no registration required or something. I wasn't clear what then happened. So on your platform, are people coming in and engaging with a certain amount of freely accessible content, i.e. they don't have to be a healthcare professional, they can be anybody. And then is there a point at which they have to then register in some way to become part of a verified database so that you can then do your IME, CME program? You, you sort of see what I'm saying and where I'm going with that. Is that, is that basically what's happening? Um, so they like we have a disclaimer. Obviously, all our content is aimed at HCP, so it, it's kind of the self uh, declaration oh, okay. of being HCP. It's not we're not aiming it at, for example, patients or the general public. So that's definitely like something that we always caveat on all of our content. Um, but in terms of the quiz, it essentially is like hosted on our microsite. So once people click on that, they can easily get into the quiz and it's it's kind of integrated into that page, as well as those news articles I spoke about. And then there was also a kind of sign up button, which obviously we were really uh, pushing people to do so that they could be um, notified when any new content came out. And then they became part of our database for that FOP site. So we saw that kind of build up over time. OK, so accepting the fact that you said this is clearly for HCPs only, I could come in and take the the um, the IME content, can I? Yes, you I can. Mean, and, and, and my yeah. question, and I'm not trying to put, I mean, I'm just trying to understand context. And then my question bluntly is, you know, what do you know about your audience? Because if anybody can come in and take this, take this, this activity, in what ways are you establishing that it's healthcare professionals coming in yeah. and that they are actually doing things in the way you want to because the and part of this loop is we've gone out and found out what HCPs want to do we're delivering it mm -hmm. how do we know that the audience is actually the audience we want in order to say that it's actually delivering what we want to deliver you see what I mean I'm yeah. just trying to clarify that well for some of those more sort of uh, in-depth 
content pieces there is a registration process so it's nice to okay. come in and and see the news or the quiz perhaps but they have to register they have to declare they're a healthcare professional and they state where they're based and and what their specialty is i get you know it is self-declared in some of those cases but we also have um you mentioned earlier healthcare um professional um platforms and we, we've just launched a new one now within Springer um, Healthcare um, called springermedicine.com and for that there is a validated HCP right. process where it will be checked and validated before you enter some of the content there so it can be both and, and perhaps we are moving more towards the stricter validation um, style. Okay, okay. Caroline, it looks like you want to say something. Go on. Yeah, only because I've just seen a comment come in about the social media as well, because that, that is a good point, mm. like that using social media sort of can negate the healthcare professional thing. What we do for uh, certainly for a lot of the recent programs I've worked on is we we only target validated, verified healthcare professionals. So the 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 IME CME tweets that have gone out for, for specific programs, I wouldn't see them, including the polls, because I'm not a verified HCP. So we work really closely with um, specific sites, social media platforms to make sure that only the right experts in the right geographic areas see the content. OK, um, I saw a question come in, which is worth just touching on, but let's not get bogged down it because you did sort of address this, but asking about pharma company funders and approval of content. But essentially, and, and, and slightly simplistically, but we're talking here about medical education in terms of IME slash CME. And I think you did say, and let's just reiterate, that what that means is it's grant funded, it's arm's length from the funder. Um, so in principle, well, in, in practice, your funders, as in the pharma companies, aren't approving the content. The idea is they give you a grant and they and they and they are reassured that, you know, they're not wasting their money, as it were. But basically, the grant means that you then have the independence to go and do that. And that's just quite an important principle mm -hmm. because medical education, med ed gets banded around our business all over the place. Um, lots of things are defined as educational. And, and there's a bit of a sort of, you know, I, I, I've got a bit of a history in this sort of thing. I just like to make it clear that what we're talking about here is that independent medical education. The CME, IME difference is accreditation or not accreditation. But basically, we're talking about grant funded arm's length education. Everyone's just nodding at me, but I think that's a really yeah, important that's, point that's to put out. That's right. There. Okay. And, and the final say and the approval will, will be with our program directors and our faculty with the directors, rather yeah. than with any educational funder, yes. Just out of interest, sorry, I'm going off in a slightly uh, wider direction here. That's, we talked about healthcare professionals, but all we've really talked about are doctors, I think, in terms of what you've said so far. Just give us a sense again. I mean, do you have multidisciplinary type programs, mm -hmm. nurses, farms, whatever? Just give us a sense and state the obvious. Presumably, the principles we're talking about apply to any HCP in the way that, frankly, they apply to any of us. But just, just cover all that line off because I think all we've talked about really so far is doctors, yeah? Yeah, absolutely. But we obviously provide education for a range of audiences. So we run an annual uh, meeting every year where it's purely nurses. It's it's just nurses in the field of paediatric endocrinology. And so there we work with an accreditation body, the, the International Council of Nurses. So they have credits, just nurse specific credits. So yes. And we've also run other programs, um, one in chronic kidney disease, where it was the sole focus of that was bringing in all the multidisciplinary specialties together to discuss that. And that was a challenge for obviously when we went out and marketed that program. But yeah, we can do, of course, and primary okay. care as well. Obviously, and and primary care. And so again, we're, we're sort of stating the obvious, yeah. maybe the obvious, but it's worth stating these sort of things. And, and following a question that I just saw pass by me a moment ago, but I've now lost it. But the but, but drawing just a little bit further on that one, I think what you're saying is, uh, or, or maybe the question is, do you see differences amongst those different groups of healthcare professionals? And the question that's come in is, do you see differences amongst different specialities? And I think the answer is probably yes. And that without getting too bogged down in it, can you give us a bit of a sense of some of the, some of the differences that you find anyway? And, and Caroline, you're nodding away like that. Do you want to pick that one? Sorry. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I'm nodding because yes, absolutely. The, the two... Um, about specialities that come to mind um just recently been looking at some data that spring and nature has actually done they we were talking yesterday amongst ourselves about do we need to do it the next iteration of the survey and actually spring and nature have just done the survey independent of what we've just done but they've done it in oncology and in cardiology um really asking the same thing broadly speaking across nearly all specialities the need for bite size learner directed uh easy to access content seems to stand 
quite fair. But for example, we do see differences in, onco in co oncologists are much more wedded to peer reviewed journals, for example, that is that are those are tend to be the top places that they will go for trustworthy data. Uh, cardiologists a, a bit broader in, in where they go. Um, surgeons are, are 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 a different kettle of fish altogether where they they can't just dip in and out uh, so they are absolutely wedded to maybe more interactive pieces outside of work hours so there are nuances that god you could have a whole webinar on exactly, that yeah, but yeah 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 yeah, 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 yeah. yeah and I, I i realize that some of these topics we could have entire webinar in fact we probably have had entire webinars on so we're skipping over the surface of a lot of this stuff but if we're giving if we're giving people a sense of the sorts of things to think about i think we're doing something useful and um, i did want to um dwell slightly on i mean it was your presentation was all good positive and, you, and I, I i mean you 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 added in the but there was a problem with this aspect of it which is a very nice way of balancing things out so thank you very much for that um but that is an interesting area i find interesting and there's we have had a couple of questions coming in specifically on those case histories and so on that, are, that are, it's a nice idea getting the audience to contribute case stories and and you know as long as i've been around on the internet there's always a part of a proposal which is crowd generated content get the users user generated content get the doctors putting their cases in and talking about it because that's great and it's very engaging and frankly i can sit back and drink my cup of tea while they're dealing with it sort of thing okay i'm sort of interested because i and i do think you sort of touched on it and the questions are touching on it that's really very difficult to make happen in real life isn't it it's a nice story that's very difficult and i just wonder you sort of talked about the fact you're looking into it and it's something but have you got a bit more you can give us in terms of whether you really think actually it can work and if so how or whether actually you just think it's one of those things that actually in truth nice idea but in in practice doesn't often work just I, I think it can work I, I'm, okay. I'm going to be an optimist here I think it yeah. can work I think you've got to choose your therapy area and maybe your program quite well we did have a program um, looking at hyperglycemia in, in diabetes and, and we slight the format there was we asked for cases before a webinar. We said submit your cases. We had a kind of template form and we were going to choose pick and choose the best of those to feature in a webinar. And if I'm truly honest, I thought we won't get any and we'll have to sort of just, you know, work with the faculty as normal. And we got loads. And we actually had to have that meeting where with the faculty, we sifted through all the submitted cases and chose the best. So I was wrong, very happy to be proved wrong in that case. So it can work. But I think in this case, it was too rare of a disease. We know that, you know, clinicians will go their entire career without seeing the case. So we perhaps chose the wrong programme to bring that element in, I, I think, if we're being honest in hindsight. Anyone else got a comment on that? Rebecca, have you got a comment on that? Yeah, I think I, I would definitely agree. I think it does depend on the the therapy area you're working in. And also, I would just say, in terms of format, I do sometimes wonder if in kind of live situations where they're very kind of engaged with what you're already talking about, they're probably a bit more likely to share. So going back to the webinar for FOP, um, as I said before, like that was one of the most engaged Q&As I think I ever saw. And they weren't necessarily sharing cases but they were sharing like a lot more of their practice so like I can't think of examples but I just think when they almost feel like they're in that group environment they might be a bit more likely to share than a kind of form on a website um, so I think it's about just judging that and like obviously leaving it open for people that are less confident to share in group formats are providing them an opportunity to share as well. But I think, yeah, I think for the FOP, we asked for quite a few different fields. So maybe that was where we went slightly wrong is it was, they didn't really know how to complete it. So maybe it would work better if it was just to kind of submit your thoughts or questions kind of style input, then it wouldn't have been so I, constricted. I just think it's fascinating, you know, because as I say, there's lots, a lot of this is easy to talk about and, 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 and you can usually find an example where it works. <laughs> But it's um, it's just you know, and then you try and do it yourself, or in a, you know, and it doesn't really work. I spend a lot of my time trying to get people to, you know, send me questions or involve in conversation, or, and it becomes a sort of a 
just a sort of a it's a, just a standard line on everything I send out. So, you know, give me your credit. And it never it almost never happens. And once in a while, something happens and you're completely taken by surprise and then you have to deal with it. But sort of managing expectations can be quite important in there. And I think one of the problems also is, especially in like a, a, a public or semi-public type environment where you're asking questions, if you're not getting questions, it becomes a completely self-defining uh, thing because nobody will join in after they've seen that nobody else will join in. So there's, there's I mean, I know there's tricks and there's ways of doing it, but it's just more challenging, I think, than than, than necessarily people think if they haven't actually tried it themselves to be frank um i get we're, we're as usual we're running out of time we've got quite a few questions there and um, i think we've covered some good ground there and i think we probably ought to wrap up caroline to be honest it looks like you want to say something again so do you want to have a final word on what we've been talking about and then we'll draw a line here for the recording okay yeah thanks Pete. this is just a really quick comment just reflecting on what you were saying about you know what what encourages people to share uh, and i think what what you've all said really reflects with what i sometimes see with the journal media uh, journal social media um because you are and i think it is about creating that ecosystem where people feel comfortable enough they have enough information in an, enough different formats to um I'll give them the confidence to open up because you sometimes see this with journal articles especially like uh, with the patient physician perspectives for example are really good examples where there's loads of articles that get no alt metrics you know the journal tweets it and then no one picks it up you get some where it's the right format of like a patient voice healthcare professional expertise there might be an interactive infographic and you just you see one person tweets uh, with their experience and then it becomes a snowball and it, it it quickly becomes into a community but it just shows that there's a lot of nuances with each different community about how to get them engaged and and a yeah i think it's a mix between format comfort level accessibility and yeah. confidence and also, I mean, on that particular example, it can often depend on who the person is that tweets first, yes. as it were, because if it's the right person who's got some followers or caps, you know, it's all there's an element of luck in there as well. Um, so there's a lot of different elements in there, which I think, is, you know, we've covered a lot of that off. And um, I am going to have to draw a line to that. Um, uh, those of you in the audience at the moment, don't all rush away because we have got a few minutes and we will carry on talking to the top of the hour. But I think in terms of the recording, uh, we've had our time and we should probably leave it there. But some great ideas in there. And I always love anything where there's some, you know, we've gone out and looked at this and we've got some numbers and when we try to match it, and there's lots more questions I could ask. And I'm not going to try and put you on the spot, but I like the thinking is basically, you know, trying to think about what we're actually doing and trying to do what people want us to do and do it properly and measure as we go so I like all that sort of stuff I know I can talk for you um anybody watching this later or the audience today please do make contact with the panelists they're all very happy to hear from you LinkedIn is the easy way of doing it um if you're interested in what I'm doing medcomsnetworking.com if I can help reach out to me absolutely no problem at all um but on that note I'm going to stop the recording I'm going to ask everyone to give us a little wave and um and wish you all a good day so bye bye boy take care thanks <laughs>